through the keyboard. All right, well, thank you again for coming. And uh, again, my name is Miguel Pinabella. Um, I'm from the Film and Media Studies Department here at UCSB. And really, the focus of my talk today is this. So how, as educators, can we introduce critical theory, uh, which is oftentimes a subject that's perceived by students to be very intimidating, boring, sometimes irrelevant to their lives, as something instead that's really inviting and challenging and fun to engage with. That's really the boogeyman that I have in mind, uh, which is critical theory and its perception as, as, as all these things I, I just mentioned. And what I want to do today is quickly propose the mentality that I have to critical theory and approaches in the classroom to demystify this uh, perception and to get students talking to and debating with one another in a way that really starts to chip away at this facade. So a little bit of background I think is important. So in film and media studies, students are often required to take these intro to film classes that introduces the language that's necessary right, to kind of analyze films and to analyze media. And then they're given these history courses that contextualize it and situate media and film within a, within a particular historical period. And so, uh, as you can imagine, with a department like film and media, a lot of people want to enter the industry, right, to work as filmmakers, cinematographers, editors, and so on. And so uh, these kinds of theory classes uh, can oftentimes be potentially alienating to students because they're getting exposed to really heavy theorists like Michel Foucault or Jacques Derrida, uh, who they are not you know, immediately you know, understanding as how this fits into you know, my career trajectories. And so the theory courses are often taken uh, in the last you know, one or two quarters of their career because they save it as one of their final things. And so to some, these classes can feel like a chore, right? These really dense reading that they don't often finish, uh, difficult concepts like post-structuralism, biopolitics, whatever. And so these can be really challenging to educators to teach in the classroom. And so that's the problem here, right? You have this perception of really high-minded European philosophers and theorists who are well-read and serious and who look like that. You know, they're kind of like surrounded by books and um, they feel really intimidated, right? And so my solution as an educator is to start chipping away at this facade and to suggest the joy and the humor really the humor of critical theory, by humanizing these figures and approaching their theories in ways that are both jarring and really unexpected to them. Um, so one way I do this is to talk about the theorists' pet preferences. So this is the same set of theorists. Uh, on the left is Michel Foucault, on the right is Jacques Derrida. And then Olga, I'm glad that you brought up your cat, Dante, because uh, the pet preferences is, I think, a really, it's, it's very revealing about the character of certain theorists. Right, so Foucault's cat is named Insanity, and Derrida's cat is named Logos. And so this discussion point, their pet preferences, and I include these photos on the syllabus of my, of my section, uh, is really an examination of their pet preferences. Uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of welcoming uh, icebreaker or discussion to get them into thinking about critical theory rather than just jumping into the terminology or rather than just jumping into the, the texts, right? And so rather than directly ask a student to summarize or critique the theory, I instead ask how these theorists' pet preferences reveal aspects of their worldviews and their personal politics. So in a sense, I'm asking them to map their personalities onto these pet preferences. I mean, if you know anything about Foucault or Derrida, I mean, the names of the cats, I think, are quite revealing. Um, some other pictures of you know, dogs and cats. Um, so this is one example I have in class, um, and you don't need to read this full quote, but basically I select the passage from one of the readings, uh, and I have students basically get into groups of two or three, and they're tasked with two things. One is to explain this argument, and then two, argue whether or not the theorist was a cat or a dog person based on this kind of passage, right? And so at first, I think students are quite suspicious or unsure what to do with this because this is, again, something that they will never encounter, I think, in, in higher education unless somebody takes this up. Um, and so, however, after a couple minutes, um, you know, just kind of get, if, getting into this exercise and starting to figure out, you know, okay, this is an, actually a pretty easy question. Are they a cat or a dog person? And after a couple minutes, students will get into very furious debate about whether or not this theorist is a cat or a dog person. Again, because the, uh, the stakes are, are, are much lower, right, than just kind of explaining what biopolitics is or post-structuralism, right? And so, um, yeah, this is some of the strongest debates I've seen in a classroom. 
And uh, the, you know, they're debating this by bringing up these, the language, right? They're doing these really close readings of these quotations. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer with these kinds of exercises. Again, it's to get students to feel more compelled to voice their opinions, especially when the prompt is you know, a lot more relatable. Um, and then the other exercise that I had in mind uh, was this BuzzFeed style who said it quiz that I give students. Uh, it's not so much a graded quiz as it is another kind of discussion exercise uh, that's meant to you know, introduce humor into the classroom. So here students are given worksheets with a number of quotes that they need to attribute to either one of the two theorists or an angry YouTube comment. And so the pedagogical logic behind this assignment is very similar to the previous one where uh, basically we recontextualize critical theorists, often again thought to be intimidating and serious and irrelevant to their lives, with something that's more relatable and a familiar format to students, right? These kinds of BuzzFeed quizzes that they take online. Um, and again, the assignment is structured to facilitate debate, right? So reading a quote like this, whenever I look at a puddle, I no longer see a puddle, one should attune themselves for nature to take time out for themselves, that sort of abstract time, the reflection of yourself, of your time being essence, right, has this kind of rhetorical kind of language that seems like an academic thing, and they get in this you know, heated debate as to whether or not it's you know, one of the two theorists that they read for the week or an angry YouTube comment. And it's a YouTube comment for that one. <laughs> so I, I make it very obvious to students by including a lot of the key words in these kinds of quotations so that they're able to figure it out if they've done the readings. Uh, but again, this is a way to get students into actually engaging with the material, the language of these theorists, and to get them to talk to one another in a way that's you know, more accessible and fun, right, to debate and to really argue about these kinds of things. So again, to sum this all up, uh, basically one of the problems of teaching critical theory is this perception of intimidation or irrelevancy of these theorists. And uh, one of the ways I'm trying to do here is try to circumvent lecturing material straight on and instead steer the conversation in ways that are productive and creative uh, and really jarring and humorous so that one, they remember the material a little bit better and two, it's a way for them to kind of access this material. And thank you. We really have time for one question before we need to like move into the other room for the closing uh, ceremonies. Um, does anybody have a question for Miguel? Yeah. Thank you so much for this. I mean, so many ideas for exercises to do in class. Um, I particularly love the one about close reading because it mm -hmm. kind of forces the students to engage with the text, which is something that we really have a hard time doing. Uh, do you? kind of like incorporate a, a freestyle uh, a prompt in maybe when they have to produce writing responses, do you ask them to write about whatever they want or whatever inspired them about the theorists, or do you have a set of prompts that you prepare? Sure, um, actually yeah, absolutely. And one of the classes that I'm teaching right now, uh, it's a humanities class in film and media, but the professor requires them to purchase a scientific lab notebook, which is quite interesting. And they use the lab notebook to do these in-class writing assignments. So they do these in-class writing assignments during lecture, and I also ask them to sometimes do it during my section. So like maybe five minutes where they're given a very, you know, pretty simple kind of prompt. Uh, and that is, the, the writing that they produce is used to kind of facilitate discussion later on. And so the questions that I have for later discussion are basically kind of uh, expansions of that previous kind of thing. And it's been very productive. 